Oh yes, so, so the basic idea is that I'm a scholar, academic, and a practitioner, because uh, in that coalition uh, for advance of a democracy, I try to promote this rule, uh, these best practices, these cases, whatever works. So this helps me like to analyze and then to push this into practice. So I would like to share with you these um, research findings, which I conducted when I was in Estonia. And I really wanted like to dig uh, like what's happening with the petitions? Why do some work? Why do others don't? So I, I didn't have any like grand theory or something. I just just really went went for interviews first of all and um, talked to people who are doing that. So uh, what's the challenge? The challenge is uh, you know people do sign uh, petitions. They like there are always people who want to say okay. We will address this to the government, to the president, to the parliament, we want to achieve change. Uh, but what, what's really happening? Uh, in which cases uh, is, um, uh, there is some change? Uh, there are any effects on public policy, not just you know, communication and just saying your voice, because that's also very important, but not enough if you want to achieve policy change. So I wanted to compare several countries to see how different contexts uh, combine. Because when you focus on one country, sometimes you, you can get you know um, uh, locked up in one context and kind of generalize. <laughs> um, you know this happens. Um, so I re really wanted to see uh, how this goes internationally. So I chose the countries uh, which were uh, part of the Soviet Union. So they basically had the same, uh, more or less, like political economy um, uh, in the late 80s, early 90s. These are European uh, countries uh, of the former Soviet Union. And then they follow different paths, you know? So they had different, uh, let's say, regimes. Uh, they have different uh, states of civil society, uh, different uh, still, like, legacy history. Like, for example, Estonia had their, uh, its own state uh, in the early 20th century, uh, while Ukraine like, had only a very, very short period of time. So uh, many, many factors combined. So I really went to, the, to these people and I conducted 70 interviews. These were really kind of semi-structured discussions with people who were into that. For example, in Estonia, I worked, uh, talked to people who were like uh, uh, analyzing these petitions. In Latvia, the guy who started that portal, which is very successful. In Lithuania, I went to the government office and three, three public officials really devoted their time trying to explain what's happening there. Uh, in Belarus, I interviewed a guy who was um, uh, who was also launching that portal, and another guy who analyzed it. Uh, um, in in Moldova, I talked to the um, person from the government authorities, and uh, in Ukraine, I I, I mean I knew the, the the field well, so I went for for a person who actually uh, advocated the law which uh, legitimized the petitions, and also from the civil society and went to a, a top a decision maker in the presidential administration who was in charge of addressing the petitions and launching the portal. Uh, the person who actually uh, went from business from Microsoft and then went to government. So these are just kind of uh, several people. Uh, those 70 interviews covered different forms of e-participation in democracy. So here I'm just focusing on e-petitions. In addition, I analyzed uh, the platforms themselves because they presented the statistics and you can count because, you know, sometimes it goes subjective. Oh, petitions don't work, petitions work. But when you go uh, and see real hard data, okay, then you can make uh, your own independent conclusions. Uh, so, yeah, I was like physically going to Tallinn, Riga, Vilnius, of course, Kyiv, some, uh, some people are Skyped. So these are the findings. Uh, country-wise. Belarus. Uh, these are um, society-created portals because uh, the government has said, okay, we accept petitions in paper, uh, in digital form. If there are more than 10, we can address them collectively. So basically, in Belarus, these uh, work as aggregators. Uh, they kind of uh, collect all these appeals and cluster them into uh, petition campaigns. So you can even kind of, I mean, um, it's sometimes hard to calculate these uh, campaigns. Like here you see like 555. <laughs> yeah, it was uh, really a uh, round number, so to say. 
Um, so they have 600 forms and they address these, uh, forward these further to authorities. Uh, so so what, are, uh, what are the findings? What are the effects? So they don't have much effect on policy making. This is why they emphasize like ethical power that they uh, deliver their messages. Um, and say, well, sometimes uh, answers are formal, standardized, they don't uh, uh, kind of generate real deliberation. However, um, um, some local issues can be solved, like uh, renovating a park, you know, or uh, um, like um, fixing some road. Uh, uh, like the biggest uh, successful case they could recall was there is a law which would um, uh, put uh, not uh, the price in bulk, but price per kilogram, which you know helps to estimate the real kind of value of a uh, of a good of a product. Um, and uh, the government isn't really responding to political requests. Uh, for example, they wanted uh, to change this flag, which is like actually a post-Soviet flag, just with no um, these symbols. Uh, uh, they wanted to, to introduce, like, get back to the old flag, which is uh, white and uh, red crosses, but the government actually ignored that petition. They didn't answer it at all. Uh, this is why they, they know this, and they, like, really uh, submit kind of few political uh, requests. Mostly these are practical issues. The government say, oh, okay, yeah, we should be responsive, we're a good government, we'll respond to your issues. However, there is some effect. Um, I have a survey data, which is really good. I'm a sociologist. Um, I have that background, this is why I want to uh, really figure out what people want. And um, actually they use the methodology we use in Ukraine to have it, uh, um, to make it comparable with Ukraine's data. So what do we see? Uh, people uh, can have a legislative initiative, there is a dialogue, so this is like, you know, saying, like more one way, okay, we have dialogue, we discuss, we talk. People believe in this. These are multiple choices. They can uh, choose like three options. However, in terms to influence on priorities, only less than 7% believe in this. I said, so, well, yeah, we can influence, but, but these are really kind of optimistic people. Uh, the pessimistic people um, uh, say there is no impact, but in Ukraine, you'll have the same number. So it's like, you know, there are always people who are skeptical. Uh, so let's just remember this. The people have their voice but not much impact. Uh, in Moldova, um, there is not really kind of nationwide platform for petitions, not much legislature on that, uh, but they use Change.org, which is an international one, and which forwards uh, these to Moldova public institutions, like the parliament, uh, the government. So what, what I, I try to find something what, what works, they have, they have like around 100 of petitions on Change.org um, initiated by Moldovans. Um, and like the, the top one, the most popular, uh, they demanded to stop a draft law. So basically the idea is they, they wanted that the state will guarantee the funds of some loans which some private people can um, take from the government. So if these are oligarchs with really strong uh, ties with the government, they can borrow money, never return them, but the taxpayers will you know, compensate that from the budget. And they say, well, this is a huge risk, let's not do that. That will, that will kill our economy. Um, uh, and they also wanted to punish those oligarchs which kind of promoted the bill. Uh, they launched a campaign on Facebook, uh, get it 9,000 signatures. Well, that's huge for, for that kind of small country. Um, and um, there was no impact on oligarch, yet uh, they did introduce that bill. So that was like very, uh, so to say, obvious scheme of uh, kind of, uh, mixing up with people, so they stop it because they said, no, we don't want that. And it was too publicly advertised, they, okay, well, that, that's too risky. Um, but I don't know, um, I can't like say um, um, about the overall impact because I don't have any statistics beyond from uh, change.org, like I, I can figure out what, what's happening there. So it's, well, we plan to introduce petitions, but we don't know, I don't know how much, uh, how many of these did they address, so there is real lack of data here. In Ukraine, um, everything changed in 2014 because after the uh, revolution, people had really this um, you know, drive for, for, for reforms. They wanted to, go, uh, to do something. And they channeled that energy into peaceful uh, policy making. So many people went uh, to, to um, like NGOs, 
we had lots of like support, so there was like a uh, field. Uh, uh, we needed uh, like uh, new energetic people who went there, not only professionals. Some people um, collected uh, for them, for example, uh, money to buy body armor for soldiers uh, uh, protecting uh, the invasion uh, in Donbass. Some other went, went to the government. So there was a huge, huge move. And some people believed, OK, we can do something. Um, and uh, so some NGOs, they made a coalition, renovation package of reforms, um, and, um, and they um, advocated the law. And the president actually supported that. And his, um, his, uh, pa uh, his party in the parliament, and he kind of persuaded others. Um, so that there was a support from all the sides. And, and they introduced a law which said, OK, digital signatures are OK. And they should be addressed and actually quicker than regular appeals. So within five years, uh, over 500 local authorities have those uh, petition reforms. Uh, the president, the government, the parliament, and people do, do have an image that, OK, the president, he has a supreme power. He can, uh, he can solve things. So people, first of all, send petitions to the president. Over 30,000 um, those petitions. Uh, however, if you count um, those who passed the threshold of uh, 25,000, there's only 47 of them. So it's like sometimes hard to, you know, um, make a campaign. We had a really good discussion about the uh, armed right for self-defense, like having uh, firearms, how people carry them. Uh, it didn't work through, but there is some, uh, some discussion. If you go at the local level, uh, for example, in Kyiv, have almost half a million e petition users, which is 22% of adult population. I believe this is a huge number. Uh, like every fifth person has registered and uh, on the portal and like voted or signed petition or initiated a petition or something. Um, I I also persuaded uh, this uh, uh, this institution to uh, uh, there was a small grant uh, and we um, had a survey. Um, really uh, three questions. And we figure out that 27% of people aware of petitions, well, not much, but the good thing is that uh, of those who are aware, two thirds, they support them. So say, okay, there are some challenges, but it works. Um, so what can we say in general? That actually they do work, but at a local level. So in towns like, for example, Kyiv, people demanded and they got the night routes of public transport. Like, there was no public transfer after midnight, no single one. After that, we had some trams, some tram routes. They were kind of testing how to do that, um, and some other minor things. But I mean, I believe that uh, night transfer was, uh, was a good uh, accomplishment. Uh, also have survey data. Um, and also, we see people say some, uh, something. They have an initiative. They have a, a, a dialogue. However, if you compare to Belarus, not 7%, but 23% uh, people believe that they can impact the list of priorities. This is like three times higher than in Belarus. So people uh, in Ukraine really be believe it helps. Again, 17% of skeptics, no impact. Uh, so the Baltic states, um, they have two major platforms. One was earlier in 2010. This was later in 2015. So it did its own air. Um, it, it, it wasn't legally binding, like the government wasn't obliged to even consider it uh, because it was inside with digital signature. So they can't precisely identify a person. Therefore, uh, it was like more like uh, public awareness raising campaigns. Um, uh, but you see they have like 200 of petitions, 47 reached the threshold, actually more than in Ukraine. So they like more, um, you know, drive the the the, the better communicating among themselves. This later uh, platform um, had, I counted over 100 of petitions, but I believe that they cut unsuccessful ones. So there might be more. It looks like they kind of uh, just give to archive unsuccessful petitions after some point. But at least 27 reached the threshold 1,000 petitions. Uh, and, and these are signed by digital signature, and, and authorities have to respond to them. So um, experts say there is more deliberation, more weight uh, of these um, initiatives, and several of them have make up draft, draft bills. So there is some you know, impact, not much, but some. 
um, Latvia, special case. Uh, they had really, really deep political crisis. There, there, were, there were riots. People were throwing like stones in the government buildings, uh, and the government was terrified. And, and then some uh, activists came up with solution. They say, uh, "What if we make a platform for dialogue and we discuss things and come to maybe some compromise?" Say, yeah, yeah, let's do that. So it was, it was a, it was a solution, a consensus to introduce um, impetitions. Um, as a legitimate way of communication between government uh, authorities and people. Um, th 